your Monday here on the OH Report, at least if you're a Browns fan, and I don't think any of my other fellow Potters are, so they're not dressed up nearly as nice as me, if you consider an old dingy t-shirt with some orange colors on it in a blazer, uh, dressing up sharp. My name is Brian Skronsky, I'm the host today, and I'm back up popping with the crew in the building once again, so let's go ahead, introduce yourselves, we'll begin over here, say hi to the folks. Uh, hey, what's up, I'm Storm, uh, you know, part of the OH Report family. Yes, sir. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm also a part of the OH Report family. Obviously, me and Storm, we mentioned ourselves a few podcasts ago. We are obviously the bigger guys, the dynamic duo, so we get our own table because we can't sit at the big boy table, unfortunately. So that's a, that's the beef of the family over here. Let's now go to the string bean portion. Uh, to my right, Hayden. Uh, hi. As and as Travis is <laughs> huge. Oh, yeah, geez. String bean and Travis. Now, come on. Oh, yeah, that's how you know it's a glitch. Yeah, I guess I'm the string bean here at the OH Report family. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I get to sit here because you can kind of sneak me in and you can't really see me too much in the way of Brian. So I'm stream bean. So we've got our meat. We've got our veggies. Now let's get to the potatoes of the group. I don't know How about Travis Barardi? Hi, I'm Travis. Yes. I'm stressed, as you can see the shirt. Uh, my teams really suck right now. But, uh, yeah, I like being here. Talk sports. It's kind of fun that being a job, <laughs> kind but, of you know, fun. it's kind of fun. fun being a oh, if you haven't Steelers tuned fan. out already, let's do what we always do on this show, where we show some love, some appreciation to some of the local athletes that we have right here in North Central Ohio, and in particular on this episode, we are going to talk about some high school football on the gridiron, where typically, though, we like to talk about some of the fast skinning kids and what they're doing, the guys that are performing, that get all the yards and all the accolades. But today, we're going to switch things up. We're going to talk a bit about the big uglies, and we've got our two resident experts right over here. So let's begin. G-Man and Storm Dynamic Duo, tell me of the high school football teams in our area, who has the best group in the trenches? Well, I've only ever, you know, went to the Shelby game, so my uh, <laughs> selection size was a little limited. But... Uh, Bellevue, you know, they really bothered Marshall Shepard. They made him throw an interception there at the end of the game. And, you know, they really made him get off his platform. They made him get out, scramble a little bit. Um, and it was just really dif- difficult, I think, for Marshall to uh, find his feng shui that game, even though, you know, he did have a big game. But um, Bellevue, man, just really bothered him. And uh, the, the best part about them, too, is I think they get it done on both lines or both sides of the ball. They really do a good job at um, protecting the quarterback as well as uh, – getting to the quarterback on the defensive end. So that might be the secret sauce if you're trying to put together a recipe of success against Shelby is just to have better big guys. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think, uh, you know, it's – can't really say it's their weakest aspect because it's hard to be better than Marshall Shepard and those boys, those skill position guys. But I, I definitely think one of their weaker aspects is their line on both sides of the ball. And, G-Man, you're going to take us into the trenches, a place where you know it. Very up close, personal. Tell us about the Cougs, buddy. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Cougars for the best Hogs group on both sides of the ball. And uh, I've played this position before. I know how it is. They're the most impactful players on the field. They get none of the appreciation. If you have a good offensive line, you're typically one of the better running teams. And that is exactly what the Cougars are. Connor Morse last game just surpassed 1,000 yards. He's up to almost 1,100 sitting at 1,099. He has 21 touchdowns. And defensively, Owen Barker, Aiden Gotze, Gavin Keynes, specifically Barker, has 10 sacks of the Crestview 21. So Crestview's D-line and O-line, they get it done, man, and they're a big part of why they're still undefeated. Yeah, I think the defensive line may be overlooked in the area. A lot of people talking about this ground game, what Connor Morris is doing, and all the outstanding numbers, and they have been great on offense. But defensively, like you said, some of these guys are getting a lot of sacks, getting in the backfield a lot. Yeah, nobody really thought that they were going to re- repeat the performance that they had last year, and I think that they're doing way more than they did because of these guys. A lot of skinny guys are not very big and not very strong, but, man, they're quick off the line of scrimmage, and that is exactly what you want on the defensive side of the ball. And Owen Barker, man, is a feast defensively. All right, I'm going to go with a group of guys that actually this team I feel like is the one in the area that seems to actually get some accolades in the newspaper where you will hear their names. I'm talking about the Lucas Cubs and what these guys do in the trenches. We all know that they love running the football. RPO means a little bit something different down there in Cub country. They average over 250 yards rushing every single night. They rolled up over 350 this last week in a win against Calvert where they didn't even have to complete a pass to have a blowout win. That's how good these guys are up front. So let's say their names. J.D. Cox, Colin Arnold, Hunter Rice, Nathan Roseberry, Zeke Zerzo. You are my MVPs for this week. Gold star for each and every one of you because they're getting it done offensively. We know that. Then defensively, the Cubs, they're just a little bit more stout in the middle than most teams that they go up against. That's why they can be D7 and they can get after you no matter how big your school is. 
Hayden, what say you on this topic? Yeah, well, I went and saw Northmore play last week against East Knox. When you think of Northmore, a lot of the time you think of their offense and those skilled positions, Max Lauer, Marcus Cortez. I was extremely impressed, though, with both of their lines, specifically their defensive line. Charles Naylor was one of our players of the game last week. He's just a sophomore, but he made such a huge impact against Peyton Lester. It was really astonishing to see. He talked a lot about he had a lot of experience playing last year as a freshman, and that's translating to this year. And then, of course, the offensive juggernaut Max Lauer. They list him as an outside linebacker, but he lines up in a position against normally to the outside of the tackle, and he makes a huge impact. He's just as hungry on defense as he is on offense, and I just think overall their lines are a big part of how they've been so successful this year. Yeah, Lauer's been eating up a lot of yards on the ground because the Golden Knights offensive line, pretty stout, Trav. Yeah, when you have a 6'10", 300-plus lineman named uh, Dustin uh, Dustin Sanders, it's, it's pretty nice to run behind him and Gavin Whited. Uh, Max Lauer, though, we've seen it the last couple of weeks. He just runs guys over. He breaks multiple tackles. You saw in that highlight, the first highlight is touchdown. He drug, what, three, four East Knox defenders into the end zone. That's what he just does. And it's first because he can get through that original line of scrimmage because his offensive line is so good. And sometimes they do go away from the big guys. They go to the left when they're on the right side, kind of throws off the defenses because all five of them are very solid linemen. But like I said, when you have that one side of two of like the biggest linemen in the area, it just helps you out. And when you have a running back like, like Max Lauer, when you have a Marcus Cortez who can weave in and out of traffic, uh, it just it, it's why they are 7-0 and and number one in the KMAC right now and in the top four in the region. Yeah, Northmore to me, their lineup, it's kind of like – um, a, a barbecue where there's no real sides, you know? It, it's like a big old hunk of beef, and then there's chicken wings on the side, and then you got some burgers to follow it up, and then maybe some Polish sausage at the end. They just got they got a lot of meat, a lot of size in there, Travis, and I think I agree that might be the number one reason they're 7-0 and right now. Oh, definitely. It's, it's a line. They have that run game. They don't have – they have the pass game option for Cortez, but – most of the time, it's an RPO by him as well. They can do a, a couple pass plays here or there, but it's that run game. It's it's what they are known for now at Northmore since they've you know, started this run of playoff streaks since 2017, since they've really come on as one of the better teams in the area here because before 2017, Northmore wasn't a football. They were a wrestling school. Yeah. And now, you know, Coach Armrose in here has has this game plan run it through, get these big linemen in front of you, and just, you know, power football. And uh, it's, it's been working in North Bloomfield Township. Well, it's definitely been working for Lucas, but we're told they don't have an opponent actually right now. Travis, uh, go to the Twitter wires or the text messages. What have you been hearing about Week 8 and the Lucas Cubs? What might be happening for them? Actually, I'm in the conversation with uh, AD Taylor Iceman right now. Hilltop, they have players in quarantine right now. Uh, there is one team that is open for Week 8, St. Paul. That's one versus that could be one versus two in the region Ooh. and a game that I know everybody wants to watch but will St. Paul answer the answer the question take the test mm. you know I I don't know St. Paul you going to do it or are you guys I guess too afraid to play the Lucas Club the Lucas Cubs in a regular season I don't know but that would be one just great a phone matchup call away St. Paul let's let's set it up let's make it happen I wish your part definitely will be in the house Let's switch gears now. Let's talk a little bit about some football and the beautiful game. And we had some impressive results last week from some of our top teams. Also, a bit of a letdown. Let's begin with one of the outstanding performances that we saw. St. Edwards, one of the biggest schools in the entire state on the road at Wu-Town G-Man. And you saw the Generals hold off the Eagles, come out with a pretty sweet win, I'd say. Yeah, Worcester got it done. It really was a heads-up play from goalie Griffin Owens, who really dominated. He didn't let anything get by him. He had one Rolled through his legs on accident, almost went in. So a little bit of luck for Worcester and the Generals, but they did get it done against a tough St. Edwards team. They beat them one to nothing. Brendan French would hit a PK kick that would be for the win, as they would that would be all she wrote, and they would end up beating Copley on Saturday, six to one in pretty convincing fashion after they dropped that one last year. So Worcester man sitting at 11-4, one of the better teams in the area. They could do some damage as a postseason is coming along. And when we talked at the midseason point about some of the top tier teams that we had outside of Lexington for the boys and Ontario for the girls, I don't remember Worcester being mentioned. Do you feel like this is a top flight school that can be super competitive as we get deeper into the season and then maybe even in tournament? I've been to a couple of their games in there. They're a very good offensive team. The, the game plan coming in 
was uh, to you know limit their offensive strikers in St. Edwards, and the, they did it. The defense really set in, and goalie go, uh, Griffin Owens, excuse me, really got it done, man. He let nothing go by him, and if it did, it was sailing out towards the back of the end. So Worcester, man, it's going to be a tough team, a very young team too. So they got a lot of improvement to do, but right now, this is an 11-4. They're a cream of the crop. Well, I talked about the Ontario Lady Warriors and how we just kind of gave them a default pass as the top team that we had for the girls in the area and still are. I uh, don't want to get that mixed up, but they did suffer their first defeat over the weekend on Saturday. Storm Blunchley, you were there. Tell us what happened. Yeah, uh, well, Ontario came out early. You know, they had a lot of shots on goal, a lot of shots that just happened to get saved, but uh, uh, Kyla Spencer would start things off for them. She would score early. And um, that was pretty much the whole first half is, was just watch Ontario dominate pretty much. Um, and then, unfortunately, you know, as the second half went on, it really started to look like Ontario was going to pull, uh, <coughs> excuse me, win this one. But a girl by the name of uh, Brooke Dieter scored two goals there. At, in, I think it was probably in, what, the last 15 minutes of the second half. Yeah, one was three minutes left. That really would do it for him. Yeah, and uh, Brooke Dieter just happened to, I think, kind of just be in the right place at the right time. She had uh, a gorgeous free kick, and then she went by the goalie on one, and that, that was pretty much it. it it just really came down to that first crucial minute for Ontario and those last couple crucial minutes for Ontario where they just kind of couldn't get it done. I think that's why soccer easily is the most frustrating sport because you can outplay your opponent so much you can still lose the contest. In your opinion, that's what happened. Ontario was the better team. They just capitalized one time fewer than the opponent? Yeah, and, and it, it really showed Ontario dominated the whole game, in my opinion. They had a lot more uh, shots that w looked good. Um uh, shout out to the Liberty Benton goalie though she looked phenomenal stopped a lot of lot of potential scores but like I said Liberty Benton I think just kind of in the right place at the right time uh, and then a match that I saw with my own eyes Mansfield Christian Clear Fork they clashed Travis you were there with me you called the match this was a big one for both sides in Richland County and Clear Fork they've been winning a lot of games here as of late the Lady Flames were undefeated hadn't been tested yet on the season and they would drop the match got shut out actually five to nothing in your opinion what is the big difference? What sets Clear Fork apart from a team like Mansfield Christian where they're able to go on the road, get it done in that kind of fashion that they did? Well, I think Clear Fork's had a couple more years to establish themselves, especially being a Division Two versus a Division Three. these two teams. Uh, Mansfield Christian starting to be on the up and up the last two years. Clear Fork, like I said, they've been developing longer and they've been playing a lot better. They have uh, they had more key pieces playing in this game. Mansfield Christian, you know, Abby Little, they really couldn't get the ball to her because Clear Fork, a good defensive presence, keying on her, and they don't really have the the second player to really cancel it out, so you couldn't just have to focus on one player and really shut everything out. Uh, also, team speed for Clear Fork. I mean, you saw them time in and time out in that first half. Shout out to Mary Goliath, though. She, you know, kept them in it at least. It was 2-0 at the half, but then after that, you know, Clear Fork just started – you know, scoring at bay. Mansfield Christian are a good squad in Division Three. Uh, Clear Fork, like I said, one of the best four teams in the district. They're going to be in a district semifinal with probably Lexington, Ontario, and Madison. But uh, Mansfield Christian is good enough to compete with the best in D3, D2. I don't think quite yet. Give them a couple more years to just get better. Because Mansfield Christian, you mentioned their star player, and then a lot of their other pieces. They got some freshmen that are in the lineup that just, uh, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for them to marinate. Clear Fork, on the other hand, they got that out of the way last year. Some of those girls now are big time players at the varsity level. And Trinity Cook, what a standout this girl's become. She had a hat trick in that match against Mansfield Christian, also handed out an assist. I really like her and the speed of Windsor. And Brittany Bechtel, how she's using that rotation. Nobody else that I've seen in the entire state, not one team is doing what she's doing, subbing out five, six girls at a time because there's not a big significant drop off when they do that. So I think that that has been a big calculation by Brittany, understanding the depth that they have and using it to their advantage because in the second half, they get after you. Three unanswered goals against Mansfield Christian and Trinity Cook, a big reason why. So the Lady Colts on fire here as of late. So are the male Colts out there dominating in the corral, as you saw, Hayden. Yeah, Saturday, Clear Fork boys, they were still below 500 as a team. They came into a game against Huron, who came in 8-2-2. Two, two. So Huron, a very respectable team. Right off the bat, even for fall, it was pretty warm being down there on that turf in those black jerseys. It was an extremely physical match, I noticed right away. There wasn't a ton of offense. It was very physical, a lot of shoving, a lot of tripping. But they were able to finally pull away. Alex Kissler, senior captain for Clear Fork, got them both of their only two goals on the day. 
And I talked to him after the game, and he was very straightforward from the point that they were very tired coming off this week. Honestly said they just didn't really want to be there. They were tired. But if they were tired and didn't want to be there, I couldn't tell from the look of it. You know, they looked really sharp. He had both goals to get this big win for him, and he talked about a personal goal for them moving forward after winning three straight. They played scrappy early in the year. He said they're really kind of starting to click and connect. This is three straight for Clear Fork now. And they kind of have a favorable rest of the season schedule. They'll play a West Holmes team who, as when I looked, only has one win on the year. They have to play Highland, who is another team below 500. They do have to play a pretty tough Ashland team. Yeah. So Always they're not going to be someone who's looking to necessarily take away the Moac or compete for it with Ontario. But I think there's a lot of improvement there for them from the beginning of the season. And it was a good match for them, and it was Good to see. We're going to be talking a little bit later in the program about surprise teams potentially in the playoffs on the football gridiron. Do you see Clear Fork being one of those teams that could maybe get to a district championship game, even though the regular season hasn't really panned out the way that they thought in terms of wins and losses? I think that they have the talent there and the speed. They had a lot and lot. Again, talking about being tired coming off the week, they didn't look tired to someone like me, who this was the first time this week I've seen them. So, I think when they're clicking and when they have their rotation going, it's not to the Brittany Bechtel level, but they do have a pretty good rotation, and I think they could be a sleeper team in soccer as well as football. All right, let's talk about some guys and some teams that certainly, uh, they are no sleepers, they are no slouches. They were big-time performers last week, that, of course, being our Friday Night Phenom and the gentleman who got our top play of the week. So we uh, broke it down for you guys on the Friday Night Pigskin like we do each and every week. Here's how it went down according to the vote, according to you, the people of North Central Ohio. Back here on the Friday Night Pigskin presented by MTD Products over in Shelby. It is time for everyone's favorite part of the night. That's right, it is highlight time. But first, we put a lot of weight on your shoulders out there, the fans, each and every week to determine what the best play was that we captured with our cameras and then also who the best performance was each and every week. So let's show you what the fan vote decided this week from week six. Let's check out the Phenom. And here is your winner from the Clear Fork Colts. I believe he's a two-time winner now. How about Victor Skoog, who had a flat-out awesome performance in a victory against Galleon. He threw for almost 200 yards in this game, had 12 completions as well. Also did some nice work on the ground, as you saw right there. 67 rush yards for Victor. He is a workhorse. Three total tutties for this Colt as he led his team to victory. And like Coach Will said, one of the hottest teams in the entire area, if not the hottest, it's the Clear Fork Colts. Thanks in large part to your phenom from week six, Victor Skoog. So that's the best individual performance that we saw, but how about the best overall play? We roll out five nominees every week. You, the people, decide. And after all the votes came in, how about this? To open up the second half at the Castle in Northmore and Fredericktown wasn't dead just yet, thanks to Tegan Rule. Taking this kick return all the way back to the house, 84 yards. The Knights would have the last laugh, but he, Mr. Rule, would have the top play of the week. And, of course, every Monday we roll out the top five plays that you get to check out as well as the best individual performances so you have to watch the oh report video podcast every single monday and then weigh in make your vote count so congratulations to both of those victors from week six but it's a whole fresh new week now so let's go ahead and meet the nominees beginning with the friday night phenoms from week seven so here we go let's begin with Kalen Lamaster, the running back from the Centerburg Trojans, who was flat out electric everywhere on the field. He did it in the run game, receiving also in special teams. His last name, I believe if you break that down into French, would be The Master, because this guy was exactly that on the field, Hayden. He took over in just about every aspect. Yeah, four total touchdowns on the night. You can see right here, Lamaster definitely has some speed once he breaks through that initial first part of the line. Here he's doing it on the return, and I don't see anyone probably within 10 yards. Mm -mm. Uh, He's just getting it done all over the field. Good to see him involved in many different facets of the game. 
It's always nice when you can have an elusive back who you can use in the rush game, the pass game, and be a danger on the return side of the football. Total complete package, Mr. Lamaster. 142 yards on the ground and making some nifty plays too. And you see him getting into the end zone on special teams. The trifecta for Mr. Lamaster. Victor Skoog, uh, man, it seems like he's pretty much making his way onto this list every single game. This wasn't one of his best, according to his head coach, but still good enough to make our countdown. Because he, again, he's one of those, he's like a, a Mrs. Dash mix, where it's it's kind of a full combination. There's a little bit of salt in there. There's a little bit of pepper in there. There's a little bit of spice in there, too. G-Man, you've seen him with your very own eyes. You know, he, he's wiggly out in the open field. He makes plays happen with his feet outside of the pocket. So this offense... They need him to be a playmaker, and he has been. Yeah, Brian, I've seen him in back-to-back -back weeks. He got my uh, my vote for nominee with uh, the Ginsey Island game, and of course at the Ontario game, he got it done too. Got pulled at the after his second interception. However, right. he still had a huge game. 92 passing yards, two touchdowns, 43 rushing yards, and a rushing touchdown. So big uh, day for Scoot. Yeah, and speaking of huge games, how about this? 375 yards of total offense. This is what the Tigers have been looking for. Brock Hill was able to deliver in a big win, a come-from-behind win at that for the Tigers. So he was finding his guys out in traffic. I really like his escapability outside of the pocket. And then he's one of the more physical runners at the quarterback position in all of North Central Ohio. So when it's all on display, Storm, this guy, pretty special, had another fantastic night. Yeah, and I think this is kind of routine for him now. I mean, uh, Brock Hill's definitely one of the more special talents in the area. Like, look at that arm strength right there. And, you know, a guy who can get out of the pocket and, and, and get some yards with, le with, his le with his legs, excuse me, you know, keep the defense guessing. Always a good thing. Max Lauer back on the list for the second straight week. He's been a bell cow. 30 carries again. He got into the end zone twice, went over a honey bun one more time. I love what this guy brings in terms of his physicality, his speed. He is a true total package. He's a thunderous runner in the open field. I know that you just love him, Travis. And just that highlight right there, he drugged three defenders into the end zone. He gets through that original line of scrimmage and just watch him work. He battles until the end of the play. It looks like he's down sometimes and he just gets right back up and continues to push the line. And like I said in a couple segments ago, one of the main reasons why Northmore is 7-0 and looking for their first undefeated season in school history is because of him and that offensive line. But how about Marshall Shepard? He's been on our countdown every single week. He's the only one who is 7-for-7. Seven 7. 17 of 28 is what he did to get back on our list. He threw it into the end zone three times for Tutties, over 260 yards. Storm, we've been letting you advocate for this guy. You haven't been getting it done. The votes aren't coming in from Whippet Nation. So, Hayden, you're a Shelby guy. Tell your community, why are they missing out? Why is this guy worthy of a vote? Well... I would, from the simple point that this is probably a down night on the stat side for, as Storm shakes his head, this is a down night for this guy. This is probably all the other quarterbacks in the area's dream game. So Storm even offered to shave his head. If that didn't work. I don't want to know what else would work. At least get this guy a win before the regular season's over. Just do it. Should do we it shave for the town. Hayden's head? I don't know. What do you guys think? So Can we put I that don't on the line? With that. Yeah, you know what? We'll, we'll toss something up on the line this week. We'll figure it out this week with hair. Just get the guy oh, a win. Your All right. love I'm that. gonna have some buzz clippers. I'm gonna have a little bit of dye here in the studio. Vote online each week. Make it count. Now here are your plays of the week nominees presented by MTD Products and Shelby. Feast your eyes on the top five plays from week seven. Let's begin with play number one, where there's fast boys, and then there's Scoog speed. To show you the difference, here's Victor exiting left out of the pocket against Ontario. Notice the opponent's getting smaller in the rear view until here. Scourge cuts it back in, just passing through for six. G-Man, how does he do it? He shows off tremendous awareness, escapes the pocket, and he uses his vision to dodge multiple defenders with his speed, and that's what makes him so dangerous. He can run with some of the best running backs in the area. you got to watch out for him in the pocket passing, or he can cook you on the ground game as well with that 43-yard scamper. Play number two, throw your hands in the air like you don't care, and then lock in. Get the interception just like Hunter Parker did, spoiling a scoring chance for Mount Gilead by winning the tip drill right there, plus the salad blowing in the wind on the return. Turnover's always delicious this time of year, Travis. You know, when you work on a tip drill, it usually goes to another person, but this time he's like, no, 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 I'm just going to bump it up to myself and I then start it. running backwards. That's uh, good hand-eye coordination and the ability to stay on your feet and pick it off yourself. 
as we go to nominee number three, Brock Hill, gonna execute the escape plan out to the left, and he's got his man, Mr. Owens, playing the accomplice, hits the juke move, and cue the fight song. Tigers come back to beat Ashland, thanks to plays like this, Mr. Parlett, beautiful stuff. Beautiful uh, pass and catch, and right here makes the biggest move right there, makes a defender, drops his ankles at the Ooh. nine yard line, and then gets in for the end zone with reach. The Golden Knights are 7-0 because Marcus Cortez basically had the Midas touch here, guys. Check him out. He's zigzagging, he's pinballing, and he's rolling in like a bowling pin for the Golden Goose. The Edge East Knox, huge touchdown in front of the student section. Per, uh, Cortez is performing like a king at the Castle, Hayden. Yeah, we talked about it earlier. Credit to the O-line for opening this up for Cortez, but the rest from that point is all Cortez. A couple times I thought he was going to go down, able to pinball around like you said, use his quickness and speed to get into the end zone at play number five marshall shepherd going to be cooking a back shoulder roast at nominee five isaiah ramsey pulling off a slab toe tapping two like he's doing the river dance in the end zone corner at skiles where they're breaking all the records right now storm yeah i mean just a perfectly placed ball by marshall shepherd puts it where only isaiah ramsey can go up and get it and that he does comes away with a touchdown of his own so those are the nominees you vote and decide who was the best of the best from week seven. Well, guys, lots of teams are going to be getting into the playoffs in football this year. 16 from each region. Is is that too many, first off? Is that just too many teams? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it yeah. does seem like a lot. Yes. 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 Yeah. We all kind of universally agree. Well, one thing that it will allow for is going to be some Cinderella stories, guys. Teams with some subpar records or even, you know, a softer schedule are going to get in. But of the teams that probably won't be hosting in week 11 – who do you feel like could make the most noise, pull off a couple of upsets on the road, maybe get themselves into a regional semifinal or a regional championship game? We'll begin right here at this table with Mr. Gray. Yeah, thanks. I, You're I, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I chose a team yeah. that I got to see play week one of the season. Competition wasn't that great, but they've done some things this year. I picked the Centerburg Trojans. They're currently sitting at 4-2, and 2-2 two, two and two in conference play in the KMAC, which is a really competitive conference this year. But like I said, they won the KMAC last year. They're currently 11th in the D6 Region 23, so they're on the outside looking in of a home playoff game, but definitely in that top 16. Um, they have some guys that we've talked about this year in phenoms and top plays, Jack Gregory, Tyler Johnson, to name a few. Those are really two big playmakers for them. And their remaining schedule I think is kind of favorable in their favor, they play Danville this coming week, who's 3-4. and four. They do have to go play Northmore, who is undefeated, and we talk a lot about. So I think that's going to be a real test to see could they be a legitimate sleeper. And then they also end the year with a Fredericktown team who is 3 and 3-4. So I think the Centerburg Trojans could be one of those tricky teams who are a little bit upset about not being focused at the front of the KMAC this year. And everyone loves to play spoiler in some capacity. So I think they could be a team who wants to stay quiet, but as they move on into the rest of the season here, into the playoffs, they'll have a chip on their shoulder. Well, one person who can never stay quiet when it comes to the KMAC, KMAC Trav, I see him over there. He's hearing about Centerburg. He gets all excited. Uh, who are you thinking for this one, though, Travis? Clear Fork Colts. Oh. Out what? of the MOAC. Okay, uh, Clear Fork. In their five wins, all five wins, they've scored over 35 points. Their two losses, their opponents, Granville and Bellevue, a combined 12-1. and one. They good. sit in seventh right now in D4, Region 14, and behind Victor Skoog, who is in the top 10 in passing in the area. And also, as we could see, he had run. He has over 1,500 all-purpose yards. Uh, that defense, you know, a Dave Carroll defense that everybody knows about. They had the down year last year, but this year I think – they can get the next two wins. They have a game against Marion Harding, four and three. That's going to be some points. And then the big one, possibly for the MOAC championship in week 10, taking on Shelby. I mean, you never know what can be there. It's going to be at Shelby, though. So, you know, they're not going to be down in the valley with, you know, all that home atmosphere. But if Clear Fork can get their next two games, it might be enough to at least get them a home game. And that really sets them up, them up for the – rest of the playoffs yeah this is an interesting debate because you went with a moac team over here the dynamic duo both also going with moac teams but neither of you choosing clear for why is travis wrong? yeah don't get too ahead of yourself uh over there track came back trav because uh i think marion harding's gonna have something to say about that uh we'll, we'll and, see in week nine and, and i think it all starts with uh brady wink he can go for over 150 yards on any given night and uh you know harding's defense really 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 good defense um like 
Uh, well, my baseline is Marshall Shepard for everything. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, toss three interception. Made Marshall Shepard toss three interceptions, which is, I think, more than yeah uh, he has on the rest of the season. So, uh, definitely crazy good defense, at least by my standards. And uh, the big thing, I think, is that they have a lot of athletes on that team, but it's just going to be putting the pieces together and uh, really just figuring out something that works because it kind of seems they just kind of go out there without really having a plan or anything. But – you know, I think if they could put it together, they're gonna they're gonna be a tough team to, to match up with in the playoffs. So maybe show up with a game plan, and the Prezies just might be a uh, tough out, huh? Yeah, I definitely think so. Okay. Well, I'm gonna tell you why you guys are both wrong. I'm going with River Valley, and that is because I believe they have the best quarterback out of all three of those guys. Yeah, I said it. Caden Shadon is having a phenomenal season. He has 1,700 passing yards, a 58% completion percentage, 12 to three touchdown interception ratio. Interception ratio, excuse me. And he can also run the ball. He leads the team in rushing with 427 yards and seven touchdowns. That's third in the MOAC, and he is the quarterback. They sit ninth in Division Three, Region Ten. They got a tough few games coming up. So they play Marion Harding next, then they have Shelby, and then they finish off the year with Lexington. So obviously they should be able to make it if they can win a couple of those games. Obviously Shelby, that's it's going to be a tough one, but I think they can they can beat Marion Harding and they should be able to top out, top out uh, Lexington and Caden Shadone. Man, when you got a QB leading that kind of offense, they spread them out wide, they get it to their athletes. It's going to be hard to tout, to beat them. Their defense isn't very good, but as long as you can put up more points on the board, that'll get the job done. Yeah, it's super fascinating that it's all kind of going to unravel over the next few weeks where these teams get to play each other, but they're all going to get into the playoffs. So maybe the 16 teams, not so bad. I don't know. I go back and forth on this, and for me, I'm a total cop-out on this today because I'm going with the Colonel Crawford Eagles. They're sitting at number <laughs> nine right now in their region, and yeah, I know that they're 5-1 and one overall in the season, but you look at the next two weeks, and they got to play Buckeye Central and Bucyrus. They're both 2-5. and five. I don't know how many playoff points are available, so the Eagles are probably still going to be real close to being on the out side looking in their big test is going to come in week 10 where they do get to play Seneca East so the winner of that game is going to vault way high in the rankings no question about that the Eagles could be nine and one though or if they're if they're eight and two for sure if they don't beat the Tigers they're playing on the road I can almost guarantee you in week 11 but I like a lot of things that this team does they're really physical they're well coached and they've got the playoff experience from a season ago where they made it all the way to the regional championship a game they probably should have won G I, I watch that highlight every now and again go back and uh, just think about what could have been for the undefeated Eagles team before they got dropped last year so I, I'm really impressed with what they bring to the table and that's why I'm going with them five and one hard to argue right only one game where they haven't scored over 42 points and that was the 35-17 loss to a carry team that's looking pretty darn good so yeah that's that's I, I like your baby. choice. It's a good team. It's a safe Will's pick. Carry. I like Blue Devils. money on the table when I think I'm going to get the best of it. All right. This is what we got coming up on the OS Report this week on our live streams and then also on our highlights for football Friday night. How about some uh, KMAC conversation, Trav? Let's take you down to the heart of Ohio. They're going to be playing Danville. I think kind of an underrated, under-the-radar team, but no, we're not. How about Moak, since that's kind of been the theme here, the Galleon Tigers and the Ontario Warriors. G-Man, you're going to see it. And we were talking a little bit before we come on air. You feel like the Tigers got what they need to get it done on the road? I think they should be able to take this one in convincing fashion. Both of these teams are at the bottom of the MOAC. Ontario 6, Galleon 5th, both really rebuilding years. Uh, obviously, Gallon's going to lose to Neath Donaldson after the season, but they got a few players that have stepped in and, and had some key uh, contribution. Cooper Kent, especially the QB, the sophomore, stepped in, and he's he's been coming along since he came in. I believe week two is when he came in, and uh, he's made some good some big strides. And I think Gallion, that's really going to help them as the seasons come along in Matt Dick's program. They're going to get some young kids to step up. They already got some varsity experience, so Gallion, they should be able to go on the road and, and be Ontario and Ontario. Uh, they're sitting outside the playoffs right now, 21 seed. So if they want any chance, they got to wish for some luck and obviously win out. So we'll see if they can do that, but it's going to be a tough task. I got a sneaky suspicion the Warriors are going to be in that game late. And I'm not saying they're going to win, but I think they're going to hang around as long as they can. Maybe the game of the night coming up is going to be Crestview going against the Big Red, a big rivalry. H how much do these two communities like getting the one up on each other, you guys? Um, it's unreal. Uh, th this is like the big rivalry in the Firelands Conference, right? Yeah, these two don't like each other. They they uh they definitely despise each other, and you don't want to you don't want to see these teams go at it, Storm, because there there might be a little bit of brawl on the field too. This yeah. one is not only for the wins for the Cougars. They obviously they're playing for some playoff for this as well as uh, Plymouth, but this one's for bragging rights. These oh, teams yeah. don't like each other, and these schools, man, 
They don't like seeing those colors. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait to see them throw down. I'm going to be on the call for that one. Really excited. And I guess they're going to have the, the fancy new turf rolled out, right? So first time on a new surface for Crestview. How is that going to affect them after being kind of on the road playing at Ashland Community Stadium over the last several weeks here of the regular season? Let's go ahead and uh, flip it. Let, let's see what we got next. What, what else we got coming up on the schedule on Friday night? Oh, now we can dive into the K-Mac, and that's where Travis becomes a big asset for us. So East Knox returning home. Uh, Fredericktown, a team that, you know, their wings haven't been flapping real high lately. They've been kind of grounded. Can they get off of the uh, ground and do anything exciting in Howard or not? Nah? Well, the Bulldogs are going to be angry after that loss to Northmore. <laughs> First, the uh, second time in six years that they've fallen to the Golden Knights. They've, you know, had that four out of five streak. But uh, Fredericktown, they're 16th right now in Region 23, Division 6. So mm -hmm. this is more of a must win. East Knox sitting pretty still. They didn't even move. They're fourth in D7, Region 27. But like I said, East Knox, they're going to be mad. They're going to want to get that bounce back win because they still have a chance to host not one, but two games. And then on the other side, Fredericktown, they got some key pieces in the running attack also that in uh, Kate Carpenter and Tegan Rule that they want to get into the playoffs right now because one more loss, it's going to be tough for them. All right, and I know that we do have one more KMAC game coming up. There it is. All right. Down in the heart of Ohio, it sounds like, Hayden, you are a believer now in these Trojans moving forward, right? Even against the Devils? I am, and I'm kind of glad that's the game I'll be at this week, as that was my sleeper team pick. Sleeper team pick, it will be interesting to see them play against a Danville team. While they're 3-4, and four, they're still pretty scrappy. So, again, I think Centerberg, they don't want to look too far into the future, but knowing their, where their record is, where they stand in the KMAC, I think that they still are a team who needs to get all the points they can get, get all the wins they can collect to help them in the playoff standings. So I think this is going to be a good matchup. They're both teams that are kind of in the middle of the pack, but Centerberg I think is going to edge out. It might be a close one, but they're big playmakers. We'll see. This could also be a runaway game. So up for a mystery, but I'm excited to be down in Centerberg. Who doesn't love a good mystery, Scooby-Doo, but we save the best for last. That's right, guys. Over at Skiles Field, one of the last games ever at this stadium, the undefeated West Holm Knights are going to be going on the road up against Marshall Shepard, the deadliest quarterback that has ever played football over there in Shelby. Storm Bludgley is going to be there, and I know he's going to be off the chain. Very excited, very bananas over there. The atmosphere with the red rage bouncing up and down. I imagine that the student section is going to be traveling for West Holmes. Are you as excited as me for this one? I don't know. You sound pretty <laughs> excited. <laughs> but, no, I'm definitely excited. West Holmes uh, undefeated. Shelby only one loss to a very good Bellevue team. Uh, this is another true test for Shelby. This is to see if they can hang with the big boys this year. A lot of people say that their schedule has been pretty easy. You know, I'm not one of those people. But uh, it's going to be a test for them for sure. Um, and the big thing is, is I think it's – the thing that most people talk about is their line is going to have to step up huge this week. Um, you, you can't let yourself get pushed around out there in the trenches, especially, you know, when this is a big game. This is for a lot of uh, playoff points, I believe. Uh, it has to be, so going to be a good one down there at Skiles. Yeah, actually, I am taking a look at the uh, win-loss records of the teams that Shelby have played, and I think you can say that – it hasn't Welcome been that game. great, but they're going to get tested over the last three weeks. That's what's exciting for the Whippets is that they get undefeated 7-0 and West Holmes, then 5-2 and River Valley, then 5-2 and Clear Fork. So, Mr. Blunchley, my friend, you are going to see some good football over the next three weeks. Oh, cannot wait. There's going to be some good baseball on tomorrow. How about the MLB kicking off postseason action? And they got a good one, guys. One game to decide who gets to move on. Hate the Yankees it. and the Red Sox. Maybe the best rivalry of all time in any sport. That's at least what people tell me. I don't really watch that much. But will you be watching Big League Berardi baseball coming up this week? Or are the playoffs just not that big of a deal to you when your beloved Pirates aren't playing? Well, not only that, the Indians, too. I watch the Indians. They're in different leagues when the Indians play the Pirates. Of course he the does. Pirates. Other than that, I can root for both teams. Both of them are out. Uh, but I, I might watch some of that Yankees-Red Sox game, a one-game playoff between the two hated rivals. And then you also have the Dodgers and the Cardinals going on in the other wild card game. I'll, I'll watch bits and pieces of the, the whole playoffs, but, you know. That's like Pirates, putting together Indians a puzzle in halfway there. and then not finishing the job. Are you guys going to be watching it all? Any Major League Baseball playoffs? Um, I will not be a part of the 25 people <laughs> that still watch baseball, unfortunately. But 
think there's um, 35. I'll probably, if I mean, if it's Game 7 of the World Series, I'll probably at least mm-hmm. watch the highlights on Instagram if <laughs> it ever comes back online. Or But sit there for a full game, I'd rather uh, not. No blatant disrespect, but not a chance <laughs> that I watch that game. Or any of the MLB playoffs, in fact. Or any MLB games. Or any MLB, probably for the rest of my that life. That sounded well, pretty blatant. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you can start with that. Just because you say, um, you know, don't let this hurt your feelings, and then you say something really mean, Jeez. doesn't mean that the feelings don't get hurt, G man. Sorry, Aaron well, Judge, just, if you tune in, just not gonna watch. I used to be a Red Sox fan, so go Red Sox. <laughs> not gonna watch though. Why? Why? Why did you stop being a Red Sox fan? Big Poppy retired. Oh, okay. Hayden, Fair you gonna enough. be watching or no? Even though it's one of the few nights of the week that no form of football is really on, I still will not be watching. No. I know Brian. No I know what Brian would say. He'd rather watch NBA preseason basketball than I MLB. Yeah, who, who I wouldn't? will be on NBA TV if you want to find me tomorrow night during Red Sox versus Yankees. I watched two innings on purpose of baseball that was not including the, Cle- the Cleveland Indians this year. So if it's not the Indians, I don't care. I'm not going to be there. I don't care anything about you i will blatantly disrespect your game football is king basketball you right there too love you guys see you next week america's pastime getting way dissed off on the witch report podcast ouch no love maybe Super something boring. on the golf all channel haters. y'all haters tomorrow all golf haters. network stress virginia, stress virginia. Stress virginia. hey that could work too